of all the empires that the world has known, two stand out as being singularly horrible to homosexuals. One was the empire of the Prophet Muhammad, which still influences the law in many countries of the world. Muhammad, the messenger, was a great general as well as a great philosopher and a politician. And he uh, laid down rules concerning the way in which homosexuals are to be killed. Uh, they are to be killed by the pushing of a wall upon them. But the empire that was most unfriendly to homosexuals was the British Empire. And it occupied, as those of my age will know, a very great part of the world, coloured pink on the map in Miss Pontifex's classroom back at the North Strathfield Public School, which I attended as a young boy. The British Empire was locked into a particular animosity against homosexuals, which it expressed in the law. Uh, and the law continued up till recent times. In the majority of countries which were part of the British Empire, the law still continues. And if you look at events recently in Jamaica, uh, in Kenya, in Malawi, and in Nigeria, you will see the horrible things that are still doing and being done to people because they are homosexual. It's appropriate to mention these matters in order to understand the things that were going on in the mind of the young Francis Bacon as he grew up, first in Ireland and then in England, in countries of the British Empire or influenced by the laws imported by the British Empire in the case of Ireland, because he knew as he was growing up that he was a person who should be thoroughly ashamed of himself. He knew that his expression was to be suppressed and was not to be spoken of, and he knew that many people who didn't conform to these rules had been greatly oppressed uh, and even killed and were subject to violence because of their sexual identity. Now, why did the English do this? Initially, the common law of England, back uh, in the 10th, 11th and 12th centuries, didn't have anything particular to say, although, of course, there were those passages in Leviticus that would occasionally be reached in the, in the readings, um, generally in Latin, uh, of the Bible that the people couldn't fully understand. But then in the 12th and 13th century, people in England started to get very upset at what they were pleased to call the French disease. It was usual in these matters for people to blame somebody else for bringing this disease into the country. And we shouldn't laugh at this because this is still what is being said in... Um, in uh, countries such as Nigeria and even in Russia, where recently I saw President Putin said, this is a Western disease that we don't want and need in Russia, Mother Russia. Uh, and so uh, in the 13th, 12th and 13th century, um, it began to agitate the House of Commons and they began to feel that there should be laws on this subject but meantime, the judges of the king began to hold that this was a particularly heinous offence because it wasn't so much an offence against another person because generally no other person was complaining about the matter. Uh, it was an offence against the community. It was an offence against the community because it was an offence against the word of God. Whosoever lieth with a man as with a woman uh, is guilty of an abomination and shall surely be put to death, says Leviticus. And so this uh, led the judges of England to hold that this was a grave offence uh, that should be visited on with a punishment appropriate to an offence against the whole community, 
Uh, and that meant that the person who was caught and convicted should be put to death. And death was by burning, a, a particularly gruesome way to end a human life. And hence the faggots that were laid under the homosexuals in order that they should burn. And generally, if the faggots were moistened, they would burn slowly and they would suffer. Uh, this situation of the English law in the form of the judge-made law, the common law, continued until the reign of King Henry VIII. Henry VIII then set upon his battle with the universal church and he decided he wanted to take over the monasteries and therefore he began to accuse uh, some of those who were in the monasteries of homosexual acts. And he said Parliament had to enact a law to provide for sodomy so that it would be punished in the royal courts uh, so that the property of the offender could be forfeited to the Crown so that he could get his hands on the property of the church. Uh, and so the law was enacted by the House of Commons during the reign of Henry VIII. When his daughter Mary, who tried to return the property of the monasteries, she being a faithful daughter of the Roman Church and faithful to the Pope, uh, the Act of the Parliament was repealed. But when Elizabeth came to the throne, she did everything she could to restore her f late father, the King's wishes, and so back came the law against sodomy and the power of the uh, House of Commons lay behind the uh, law and it was a law of the Parliament of England. And that was the situation that prevailed thereafter and prevailed, in fact, until 1957. So that if you think of it, uh, Francis Bacon was growing up, first of all, in Ireland, where he was born, born in Dublin in 1909. And then when his family moved to Gloucestershire in England, in England, with these laws which were inherited from these earlier times. And not many people questioned them. Not many people thought that this was something that should be challenged and that this was a ridiculous uh, form of punishment for a mild and unimportant variation in nature. My fellow citizens, there are still some people like that. And sadly, they are often religious people. Uh, and it was part of the reality in which Francis Bacon grew up with his family there in Ireland and later in England. Now, a couple of things started to change. First of all, the French had a little revolution and they got rid of their laws against uh, sexual offences by same-sex partners. Uh, and they did so during the French Revolution in 1793. Uh, and the interesting thing is that thereafter, none of the French laws have had such an offence. None of the colonies of France inherited that offence. The colonies of Spain, which were influenced by the French law, did not have this offence. The colonies of Germany, of the Netherlands, of Belgium, of Scandinavia did not have the offence. It was just a very special gift which the British gave to all of their uh, dominions and colonies. Uh, and uh, as I've said, it was in force in Ireland, in England, but also in countries like India, introduced by the penal code, the Indian penal code, uh, and that was copied in parts of the British Empire, and so it spread throughout the whole world. Like Lantana, it was everywhere uh, and it was just part of, amongst the many wonderful gifts that the British gave the world, they gave this offence and they gave the stigma, the hatred, the violence and the hangings that came with the offence. In the 19th century, a number of people began to question this. 
uh, Jeremy Bentham, the philosopher, who himself was probably gay. His disciple, uh, John Stuart Mill, in his essay on liberty, began to question the punishment of people for this harmless variation of nature. Uh, and in the 19th century, psychiatry and psychology, as it began to emerge, began to question it. Uh, in Kraft Elbig, a German psychologist, uh, and in the work of Havelock Ellis, a man who spent a bit of his time out here in Australia to teaching at my old school, Fort Street, as I later recently discovered in a wonderful book which was written uh, on the life of an Australian sexologist, Norman Hare, by um, Diana Wyndham. It's a book that's just going onto the market now and very much worth reading. Anyway, the philosophers and the psychologists could question this, but the law kept trundling on and the police and agencies of the states would uh, try to arrest people and uh, commit them to trial and punish them greatly. Oscar Wilde, an Irishman, had been tried at the beginning, at the end of the 19th century, and his fate was a great warning to all the Irish of what happened when uh, people didn't obey the law on sexual offences. Uh, and uh, in the Great War, whose centenary we'll be celebrating, if that's the word, next year, um, an Irish patriot, Sir Roger Casement, a Protestant, was caught uh, and uh, he was convicted of treason. But the thing that ultimately cost his life was the fact that he was convicted, or, or his, he was convicted by his own words in the so-called Black Diary that showed his homosexual activity. Uh, and in England, during the period immediately after the Second World War, when Francis Bacon was reaching uh, the uh, first period of strength uh, as a painter, um, very great people were subject to the imposition of the law. Perhaps the greatest of these was Alan Turing. Alan Turing was a man with a very unusual mind uh, who uh, had a skill in crossword puzzles and he was the person who developed the first computer uh, and who uh, used that instrument and his own native intelligence to crack the Enigma code and thereby helped to reduce the period of suffering of the Second World War. But Alan Turing went to the police to complain about a person with whom he had had sex and as a result of that, the police said, well, we're not interested in your complaint that he stole something from you. We're interested in what you did with him and why you did it. He was uh, arrested, charged, and he elected to have hormone therapy, which ultimately drove him mad, and he committed suicide. This great man who saved so many lives and was such a wonderful patriot of the United Kingdom killed himself. Uh, but others did the same, and the punishments which were inflicted on people sh showed no distinction between class. Uh, a trial took place uh, in the 1950s, uh, which captured a lot of attention, unlike most of these trials, which were regarded as the trivia of the law. Uh, this was a trial of an English lord. In England, if you want to call attention to something, you've got to get a member of the royal family or a lord involved. And so it was that this lord had the temerity also to go to the police and complain that a watch had been stolen by some young RAF personnel who'd come to his country home. Uh, and that led the police not to pursue the watch, but to pursue his unnatural and abominable offences. And this struck a lot of people in England in the period of the 1950s as just a little odd that the true offender who had been complained of walked off scot-free and the person who'd done the complaining was to be punished severely by law. These developments in England, where Francis Bacon was then living, 
coincided with a most remarkable and unusual and unpredictable event. This was the fact that in Bloomington, Indiana, a peaceful backwater, if ever there was one, in the Midwest in the United States, a scientist named Alfred Kinsey, who had been the world's greatest experts on, expert on gall wasps, a species of bee, Alfred Kinsey suddenly turned his passion for taxonomy from bees to human beings and he began to analyse the sexual lives of human beings. And lo and behold, Alfred Kinsey, with thousand upon thousand of interviews on the sexual lives of Americans, came to a conclusion that far from being uh, a completely rare and deliberate, wicked, willful and unchristian thing to do, an awful lot of people were having sex, an awful lot of people were having sex outside marital relations, and 37% of all males whom he interviewed had had at least one sexual experience to orgasm with another male, 37%. And so this began to teach Kinsey and Kinsey, a great communicator, began to teach the American people uh, that homosexuality was not all that rare, it was not all that important, it was going on in quite significant numbers that about 4% of his interviewees were lifelong exclusive homosexuals and that this was something that didn't much alter it was just a variation of nature. And that got people in England a bit upset because they began to contrast the way in which his lordship had been treated and those who knew the way in which Alan Turing had been treated and the way in which their uncle Brian or cousin or nephew Peter had been treated and it began a movement in England of letter writing to the Times and all the other paraphernalia by which a civil society of a free and democratic country in the period immediately after the Second World War began to say, enough, we've got to change this. And as a consequence of that, the government of the day, a conservative government, appointed a Royal Commission of Inquiry. And they put the Royal Commission of Inquiry into the hands uh, of uh, Sir John Wolfenden, who was a Vice Chancellor of Reading University. Uh, he was what was known as a safe pair of hands. Uh, he uh, gathered around him a group of uh, the great and the good, because that's what they do in England when they form Royal Commissions. Uh, there was the Chief um, Girl Guide of Scotland, and she was there and various other uh, people uh, were gathered together to look at the law on prostitution but also the law on homosexuality. What is now known is that Sir John Wolfenden had a son who was gay. That wasn't known at the time. But he and his colleagues uh, with near unanimity came to the conclusion that where the law dealt with this matter in the manner it had for a millennium, uh, it was not the law's business and it should stop it. That took a long while to be accepted by the English Parliament. The government of the day said, we are not ready. This is a socially conservative country. But private members' bills were then introduced into the British Parliament uh, and they resulted in 1967, a decade later, in the reform of the English law, and in the manner of those times, uh, we in Australia then began to copy the English law reforms. The first to do so was Don Dunstan, the Premier of South Australia, whom we now know to have been, at the least, a bisexual man. And Don Dunstan's uh, government in South Australia uh, got rid of the law in 1974. And that was quickly followed uh, with legislation introduced by the coalition then in power 
1976 for the ACT. In New South Wales, it was 1984, uh, and so on. But in many countries of the old British Empire, it still remains in place. Now, it's important to tell you that long and melancholy story because this was the world in which uh, Bacon grew up. He was born in uh, 1909. I was born in 1939. So he was that much older than I, but things had not been all that different between Australia uh, and England. And he knew, as I did, that when you discovered you were homosexual, that was a very bad discovery and you were supposed to be totally and completely silent. You could not speak to your parents whom you loved. You could not speak even to your siblings. You had to bottle it up. You had to keep it to yourself. You had to be thoroughly ashamed. My fellow citizens, there are still people in our country who want to inflict that on gay people and want to de denigrate them, reduce them, make them hate themselves, and they do that by the technique of unequal laws and unequal policies, and many of them are sad to me, many of them are religious, and it has to stop, and it has to change. But it didn't change quickly enough for the world of Francis Bacon. He formed a number of personal relationships, as you know. In fact, if you look at the photographs of him, including the one on the big photograph as you come towards this gallery, how convenient it was that there were enough spaces for B-A-C-O-N. And you come here and you see his face and you'll see the ruins of what was once quite a handsome face. And the early photos of him, shown in some of the walls here, show he was really, you wouldn't say beautiful, but he was a, a quite an attractive looking male face. Beauty, as you know, is to do with balance and the balance of the features. And Francis Bacon was, well, you'd say a bit of a hunk when he was younger. And he put that to good advantage because he began with the help of his house lady to put advertisements in the Times in the 1930s, then covered on the front page as a gentleman's gentleman. And uh, that led to his first relationship, which happily for him was with somebody who was not only a gentleman's gentleman, uh, which was uh, compatible with Francis Bacon, but he was also an art collector and an avid uh, connoisseur of art and he gave encouragement and later connections to Francis Bacon so that he could put them to good use as he developed his skills. And then later he formed one relationship, a passionate and loving one, uh, and that sadly finished on the very eve of his great exhibition, his first big exhibition, I think it was 1961 in the Tate uh, by the, the lover committing suicide. And then another lover came into his life and he also died, uh, apparently of a drug overdose, in 1971, uh, just as an exhibition was about to be launched in the Palais Royal in Paris. So Francis Bacon had a very hard life. Compared to me, I have had 44 years with my partner, Jan, of love and support and sustenance, which everybody should have. Most people in the affliction of those years did not have that, and most people of Francis Bacon's age did not have it. But anyway, he had his love affairs, and generally it was with people of a sadomasochistic uh, disposition. Uh, this is something I don't really myself understand and I suppose most of you here present don't. Some of you would. But if you look at the paintings in the exhibition, you'll see a lot of things which to the innocent 
might look like a lovely um, hammock. Well, they're not a hammock. They are a harness for sadomasochistic desire. And this was just the way some people of heterosexual disposition or homosexual or bisexual disposition uh, find they get greater sexual fulfilment and pleasure. And so this was this man growing up in Ireland, developing to maturity in England, with a father who'd fought in the Boer War, who had him horsewhipped when once he found him standing in front of a mirror, admiring himself in the mirror, uh, wearing his mother's underwear, um, and uh, who was a person totally unsympathetic to homosexuality, as were most people at that time. Uh, and uh, he grew up in this environment. He began to sell himself. He made through that money. He made through that friends. He made through that uh, links to the art world. Uh, and uh, that was a rather rough, hard life. He was not vanilla. He was a person who experienced the rough edges of life. And he grew to maturity uh, as a person who was taught you must hate yourself. You must not talk about things that are important and tender and loving. You must not pretend to uh, long love affairs. You must content yourself with cruel hardness. And I think this is at least a partial explanation of the power and the strength and the violence of his paintings. I'm not an expert in art and I can't really talk about it. Some of his art, I don't quite go as far as Mrs Thatcher who said, he, this is the man who paints those horrible paintings. Uh, and there'd be a lot of Australians who think that. They would look at them with horror on the newsstands or on the bus stands. Uh, but if you are here, you're here because you're interested. An artist, whether they are a musician or a painter or somebody um, in uh, literature, they have, if they're great, some extra perception, some extra dimension, maybe an extra gene or some extra capacity. And Bacon certainly had that. And this exhibition is the work of a great painter, but a disturbed man. Uh, and I think a lot of the disturbance comes out in the power of the works. Now, I believe that in uh, occasions such as this, democracy requires that this should be a, a democratic occasion and other people should have a chance to ask questions or make a comment, but it has to be brief because there are people who are going off to movies and other things. We have microphones here, and if anybody has a question or a comment or a disagreement, now is the time or forever hold your peace. But first of all, you'll give a big round of applause to the speaker. OK, that's enough. That's enough. There's a question over there. Thank you for your uh, talk tonight. Is the worthy movement for equality under the law and community acceptance for uh, the homosexual community, just a cyclical event, or can it revert? And if you think that that could be the case, uh, what can be done to secure the gains for generations to come? Well, we've made great gains. In my lifetime, I've seen great gains. Uh, but taking that extra step of getting rid of the laws that are adverse to gays is, seems to be a bit hard. They've got it, they've got marriage equality in Argentina. They've got it uh, in uh, Spain, Catholic Spain, the, the eldest daughter of the church. They've got it in Portugal. 
They are about to get it in New Zealand, in England, and in France. But somehow our parliament had, I think, the biggest vote of any parliament anywhere that's ever examined the matter against it. Something is out of step. So uh, many gains have been made. Uh, but the gains that have been made have been repeal of criminal laws and moolah, pensions, money, but dignity, equality, recognition of love, recognition that love can happen. Wasn't it wonderful to see President Obama, not only when he was before his election, when it was tricky, no, not certain he would win, when he took a stand on principle. And when immediately after he was elected, he said in America it doesn't matter whether you are Asian American or whether you are black or whether you are white or whether you are uh, of any ethnicity, whether you're man or woman, old or young, straight or gay. Now will we hear, will I live to hear in my country, the leader of my country say, the same thing. I hope I do. I mean, I'm planning to live a very long life, <laughs> but I'm getting a little impatient, and it's about time that things change and that we returned in Australia to being a secular country. Our country should be secular. We should not allow religion to <laughs> command the law of the country. You can like or dislike homosexual marriage, but that's your entitlement and my business. Uh, it is a matter of recognising the equality of citizenship in a status which is a legal status enacted by a federal parliament which should not have unequal laws for people because of their sexual orientation. So you ask what can be done, it's up to our parliament and I hope we don't wait for too much longer until Manchuria and Azerbaijan have got it <laughs> and not just uh, us. Any other questions or comments? Yes, we've got one here. Uh, you spoke about the men being uh, burnt at the stake <coughs> excuse me, for being homosexual. Were there any laws uh, affecting women? Uh, that depends on the country. The, the English law did not have a law uh, against female consensual activity, allegedly because Queen Victoria, when they l last looked at it, when it was suggested, well, you, we may have to deal with women, is to, uh, she didn't believe it happened and couldn't exist and therefore uh, it didn't happen. But some countries of the Commonwealth of Nations, when this disparity in the English law have been drawn to attention, their answer has been, oh, that's easy, we'll fix that. We'll extend the law to women. And uh, Sri Lanka did that, uh, and other countries of the Commonwealth have done it. So the answer is, the, the biblical instruction, no man shall lie with a woman, man as with a woman, was taken literally, and it only applied to men. And that was the religious offence, which the church courts originally in, in enforced. But subsequently, it's been uh, generously extended to women uh, in many countries, though it never was in Australia. In Australia, the law... Now, of course, in Australia, we've got rid of that peculiar abominable offence, and we have gender-neutral and sexuality-neutral laws so that it's the same age of consent and it is uh, for non-consensual uh, consensual activity. That's neutral as to sexuality. Any other questions? One more question before we finish up. Right. Hello. Hello. Um, I don't have a question. I'd like to make a comment. Um, I've heard you speak on a number of other occasions and I'm full of admiration for you um, and for the stand that you've taken for everybody, whether gay or not. And I would like to give a plug to your book. I'm reading your book, A Private Life, and I would just like to thoroughly recommend it to everyone. I think it's a wonderful insight into who you are today, and uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you. If I... 
if I were a vulgar book launcher and speaker, I would have brought a copy of that along tonight. I would have been holding it up at this moment and telling you, and did you notice the only book I lauded was Diana Wyndham on uh, Norman Hare, a very interesting character of the 1920s and 30s and 40s, who was a sort of steps before. But um, I'm hoping that my book, A Private Life, Alan and Unwin, discounted to $19.95, will outsell Lazarus Rising. And that depends on you. It's, uh, how much? Oh, my God. It's been reduced to $10 on eBay. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. Well, thank you very much for coming tonight and congratulations to the gallery.